so here's Blenheim uh, all set up ready to go and I wanted to talk about uh, I don't have a lot of time I'm playing raid um, first what happened so far nothing I just set it up and it was a lot of effort but I have this unit over here that I felt a unit drop while I was clipping counters and I talked about this in the setup video and I have one less unit than is listed in here well I got a response from the developer this is an oopsie uh, the manifest here is incorrect and there doesn't have to be a counter there, there, there isn't supposed to be a counter. Um, something got screwed up again. There's a lot of little errata things. <sighs> it's taken a long time. Like, it's not like I opened this game up right when I got it and said, you know, oh, let me be one of the first people to get a video to played or anything like that. It, I, I don't know how many months, but Yes, I accelerated it for things that I generally do in terms of, hey, you know, it made it through the door and now I'm playing it. But I'm by no means the first video. There's no official errata out yet. Uh, and it's just, it's kind of disturbing that at least some kind of quick patch for some of the issues, the counter misprint, stuff like that that just had to be detected immediately. I, I mean, I'm not the first person, like I said, to video this, to play it, whatever. And there's just like nothing out there, um, which is just kind of stunning. Like I'm, I'm used to stuff like this getting out there earlier. I don't know if they're like, I don't know if there's some kind of weird kind of management of the, the issue that's going on or, or of the issues, or if, it's just like this decision that GMT is making uh, that they're holding back on putting a rat out for some reason or another. Usually they start putting stuff out, you know, <laughs> a little bit quicker. And I'm a little disappointed about this. Of course, it could be, uh, you know, it could be other issues uh, that are just preventing for this game that have nothing to do with any kind of malicious plans. It just seems strange to me because I, you know, I don't know. I, I haven't, uh, am I particularly critical? I thought people usually expect the counters, you know, to match what's there. And it's difficult enough figuring out what the setup is and everything because it is a kind of unfamiliar um, uh, design to that. Along, it's workable, but along with everything else in the game, it's like, it's as though it's just made a paradigm shift from what most of what we're used to is. Uh, running from things that actually affect the game and the rules and everything um, and the core system, but also, hey, how you express what's where. Anyways, here it is, six in the morning, too early to go shopping, too cold, and I've only gotten a couple hours of sleep. I'm probably going to crash hard in a couple more hours. Might be able to slip some in, but let's get some playing in. By the way, about the, you know, the counter thing. I know I sound, you know, really negative about, hey, I'm missing a counter, you know. Uh, or so, so the thing is, obviously I was personally upset about missing a counter that I thought I lost myself. Um, but, you know, in terms of the game, et cetera, I'm glad I was told that, hey, this is just a mistake. But, again, a lot of mistakes crept into this game. Um, and also, it's becoming all too common with GMT. I'm just beginning to, like, you know, I open up the, uh, the newsletter and whatever, and then I'm just like, I just don't trust them anymore. You know, uh, and I've got enough games, so it's really, really ha gotten harder for me to buy into new games, which would be a shame if I miss something like this. Even after release, 
I, I, I would be like, oh, I actually kind of want this stuff, <laughs> you know? Like, I'm glad to have bought it, but am more and more leery. All right, let's get started. And how do we play? <laughs> we have largely forgotten some of that. Um, luckily for us, we have the sequence of play here. So we hit the artillery phase, and you know, it's whoever has the most artillery, so I'm gonna have to do a counting. I don't know. Like, I got so used to, in the last game, I fucked up with my allied artillery and got it all lost, so it became very easy. It doesn't make a hell of a lot of difference. I gotta swap batteries, too. Okay, count five per side. So, <laughs> I'll just roll a die for who gets the day. Um, uh, allies on odd. All right. You know, it's funny because getting back to personal crap, because honestly, Who's watching my second game in the, in the same uh, box? Uh, except people who are used to me, I guess. Um, a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago or so, I was actually beginning. It's hard to remember. It felt like it feels like not all that long, but time passes very quickly for me now. Um, it it felt like. I was making an effort and starting to, you know, get things, trying to get things done, cut some wood and whatever. Since then, I've been doing nothing except for my, uh, except for my Friday night dancing. And every time I go dancing, something horrible happens in terms of like, you know, a pair of pants gets ruined or something. I lose my light, uh, I lose my keys one <laughs> on my on my birthday. Uh, <laughs> just bad stuff and I, I just it's like I've gone into you know a deeper I've sunk deeper than I thought I would in this good weather I thought I'd maybe be able to break out a raid and everything anyway let's fire some guns get some markers on the board I don't expect much to happen so for the allies I feel like their choices for artillery fire and they've got first shot were relatively or so far have been relatively easy for me to choose. I just pick a stack. And I'm like, yeah, I'll probably end up hitting that. Uh, let's get something on there, reduce its damage. But it's a lot more questionable for the French. So their first shot dropped here. And it's just sort of protecting their line a little bit. The Allies need not attack there, but it's creating, you know, some terrain that is less advantageous. And maybe they'll, you know, create a gap or whatever for that artillery fire. But their second shot went here on top of, now, if they had gotten their first shot, if they had gotten to fire first, this would have been an optimal hit because I would have silenced that gun for the, for the turn. Um, so far, all the, all the shots have, fired, have uh, been decent. I gotta remember the uh, running out of ammo thing. The Allies don't have as many guns that can fire. And these guys don't move until after all the firing. Just like, you know, with the uh, uh, charge movement and then, uh, and then dress ranks, uh, you do the, the artillery based on what it's going to do. Uh, so firing is the first thing. Um, and there really aren't any opportunities to silence guns anywhere else that I see, remember these work just at the moment of combat, which is kind of funky, but, um, and, and most of these, I, you know, I can kind of try to throw some delay markers up, but they're not going to do shit to tell you the truth because uh, a single hex can be avoided pretty easily. I guess I could line up a couple of them and maybe cause some issues and maybe I ought to shut up and not fire my guns because... One of them's already ended up in a bag. Zero or one got rolled. So yeah, I gotta consider, you know? Uh, maybe it's not worth firing guns just to slow the enemy up. Hmm. Apparently that's what the French have been doing all day. Yeah, so I hold fire on the others. The limbered guns move forward. They can't move very far because uh, the cost of crossing the stream 
means they can only move one hex. They only have two moving points. And that puts me over here. Okay, yeah, one of the other little fixes I'm going to make. Whoever has the better rated commander chooses which player has to do the first action. Uh, they, in terms of here, I can't imagine any reason why you'd want to make uh, your command decisions first, but it feels absolutely wrong that the better commander, and here I'm giving the allies an advantage, that the better commander is forced to uh, activate one of their units first, one of their wings first. It just feels absolutely wrong to me. For some reason or another, I've got these reversed. They're not as they're expressed on the board. I'm trying to decide if I want to throw another another brigade up into the front. This is kind of a sparse line, but I think... So, the French just, you know, passed with one of their commanders. I think I'm okay. Like, I really doubt that there's much I want to do, except maybe move commanders to their unit. That's an interesting option. So if I move, uh, say, Wilk, somebody to Wilkie, and the decision-making there is how many counters do I have? So I have a zero counter to replace. I'm not going to move him. I'm not going to risk my commander. Uh, I really feel like I paid a price for trying to lead attacks. In the, in the last, uh, in the near winded game. Putting some thought to the causeways and what effect they have. <sighs> Maybe I should have clumped them all together. I'm looking at my commands and I'm assuming a causeway isn't a hex side, but rather crossing from an entire hex, which again, same kind of conditions I was having with the other. Uh, see, there's no actual rules on the causeways except here in the Crossing the Nebel, and they don't talk about whether it's aligned with a specific hex side or with a hex or what, but it looks rather large to be a hex side doesn't have any arrows or anything like that to point to a specific X side. But let's talk about uh, what we'd be looking at. Let's say I wanted to move this command. First of all, because there was effective artillery fire here, I can't leave these guys behind. <laughs> um, I have to, as far as I understand, attempt, when it comes to my movement, to maintain my brigade integrity, don't I? I'm, this is the thing that I'm always questioning. Yeah, it's not. Actually, I don't know if there's any requirement that I that I maintain that I try to maintain integrity. This has been one of the things I've struggled with. Is that I think that I should right. I think that I shouldn't be running ahead of my units and whatnot. But I think it's actually okay. And the only problem is if I start a turn without brigade integrity. Now they talk about, though, let's find what we've got here. We had something that I'm looking for here. This is in the non-compliance, 4.21, 4.23. This has to do... with um, things like overlaps or being uh, across the boundaries and stuff like that. But Brigade Integrity, if no units are adjacent when it's activated, almost, I don't think there's any requirement that they, that they actually try to maintain integrity. And that's, that's something that I've been continually trying to do in near Winden. and maybe I don't have to. And here it's, it's an important issue because if I had to, I wouldn't be able to advance 
beyond one hex anyway, in which case the causeways do me no good. Uh, <laughs> and then I start looking at where I've got the causeways divided, and I've got like this command. Well, these guys going across this causeway, let's say they get into a charge uh, situation. Two hexes away? Nah. They wouldn't be able they wouldn't be able to charge the enemy anyway. Uh, but I would have to like cross the causeway, turn, and try to get in uh, link up. Now I'm gonna have to if if I end up well no, not necessarily, because I've got two units here of this. Oh wait, no, this is part of this. Yeah. So this well, I got two units stacked here though, right? Oh, this is part of that. Oh, I'm okay. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, but the, the point that I was trying to make was like a terrain feature that breaks up your, your linear formation. The question comes down to do you have to uh, obtain some kind of integrity? And as I started getting later and later in Nearwinden, I'm coming to the conclusion that as long as you have a buddy with you, you're okay. As long as you have a buddy from your brigade with you, you're fine and you can operate where, however the hell you like. Now, there are issues you probably can't do having to do with the non-compliance under these three. Uh, in particular, I'm going to say um, same wing left to right. Ooh. Brigades in the command within must be aligned side by side. See, here's the thing. Must be aligned side by side and may not move voluntarily further to the left or right. Now, must be aligned side by side gave me kind of this feeling that you have to, ha you have to maintain a connection to the rest of your brigade and to the adjoining brigade. It actually sounds more like the adjoining brigade here. But if we ignored that, which we're not sure, um, Basically, you can create gaps between brigades without any problem. You can create gaps inside brigades as long as you follow the buddy system. <laughs> Everybody find one buddy and hold hands with them. If you get lost out of your buddy system, then you will end up in non-compliance for brigade, uh, or you'll end up facing brigade integrity, which is... If some units are not adjacent when the brigade is activated, those isolated units must move to become adjacent. Adjacent to what? Not to the whole brigade, just to somebody. That's the way that's worded. Now, it doesn't feel right, right? <laughs> and this is why, you know, I say I don't want to. I don't want to write rules uh, to try to express my ideas. I don't feel like the rules to the game, though, actually necessarily express what, what's intended. My initial feeling was you got to try to keep your, your, your lines formed up, right? Um, but to what extent, right? <laughs> when you're under charge orders, it makes sense that you might end up breaking up uh, that, that strict linear formation. When you're under dress ranks, you definitely should be trying to get into order. There's nothing that requires that. Um, under march orders, eh, I could see some situations where a brigade gets separated, but it kind of feels like your goal should always be more or less to keep your brigade together. And you should be doing your best to do that the one exception to that is under the charge orders, you're forced to charge in some circumstances. And if you are forced to charge, you should, you, you must, regardless of what it does to your brigade. But that's not what the rules try to say. <laughs> there's, there's no indication of that. That's sort of my own personal uh, bias based on what I understand of the period. All right, so what the fuck am I doing? I'm trying to flip another one of these counters. I, I f the English forced the French to go first. 
under my cheat rolls, and I'm just flipping leaders. I have the choice with Churchill to put him with a unit, but what I was trying to figure out is, can I attack? And the answer is no, so I'm not going to put him with a unit, and there's nothing else I fucking want to do. So what's really a simple part of the game right now, which is just all these leaders should be flipping over and absolutely nothing of interest should be happening, um, are becoming, like, it's taking up a lot of time because of some of the figuring out and trying to get a grasp on what the rules should mean and what they do mean. <laughs> is, you know, I come up here trying to get ready for bed. I'm getting all tired watching videos or whatever. I feel like I have enough energy to do a little bit more. I'm not really ready for sleep. And then I start playing and I get... One, sometimes I, get cra I, 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 I fall into a crash and I'm just tired and whatever. And I'm like, okay, I gotta go to sleep. And then I go downstairs. But the thing is, no matter what, playing the game gets me more charged up than anything else in my pathetic little existence right now. <laughs> But I really ought to pause at this point. I don't think I have time to do the entire brigade activations. I know I don't. And kind of don't want to start. Um, among other things, I would have to count all the units. I think there's more allied units than there are French units, but I'm not sure. So, because like I look at this wing, and there's seven here to four, right? But then I look here, and there's like seven, nine to six. And I got to do a lot of counting, and I don't want to do a lot of counting right now. I'd be excited to maybe start moving some brigades, but I don't want to take that first step of figuring out who actually has to go first. Um, it's going to be a lot easier once some, you know, once the allies start attacking because they'll have some units under charge. They'll be starting the sequence. And then it's, you know, I don't have to worry about counting the masses of units in march formation. Probably doesn't make much difference. I don't know. I could do it this way. Plus 3, <laughs> right? 0. Plus, uh, minus three, or plus three for the French still. Okay, I'm going to have to do line by line because this is so big. Plus three for the French, plus one for the French total, plus three for the French total. <laughs> Looks like there's more French. There's more French units. Okay, so the French will do the first brigade activation. And of course, that's just gonna be a pass somewhere. <laughs> you know, let's take this calf. <laughs> Which is why, you know, it was kind of a pointless, that's part of the problem. It's, it's a fucking pointless exercise because the allies are attacking. They should just activate something, you know, no matter what, but, because no matter what, the French are gonna be uh, picking things that pass, whereas the Allies are in a position where their support line has to kind of follow um, the attack line. And so we have a little bit of distance, especially like here, a little bit of distance to cross to get to the uh, enemy lines. <sighs> All right. <laughs> now here's something that I, I kind of don't like. So remember it takes your entire movement to get across this marshy stuff and the swamp Plus a couple movement points. I think I'm still allowed, I, I better be because I set up this way. I think I'm still allowed to move like this, okay? And that kind of doesn't bother me. Although, the way this is worded, <laughs> let's get to the uh, crossing thing, right? The crossing says, uh, any unit crossing the Nebel without crossing at a causeway must start its movement adjacent to the stream and then expend all its movement to cross. Therefore, any unit under a yellow or red artillery impact marker is prevented from crossing. Okay, red impact, no problem. You're not allowed to move. Okay, you can't leave and must stop when entering. But the yellow impact 
adds a movement point. That's essentially what this swamp on the other side is doing. It's adding a movement point. I'm going to take that. I'm, I'm going to take this as not a therefore in the sense that like that extra movement point uh, is why you can't cross, but rather a if you're under any artillery fire, you can't cross because that kind of makes sense. Anything even vague, like if you've got any hits on you, but. It also really, like, you know, <laughs> it really upsets me. But here's the other thing. I'm allowed to charge from here to actually make contact with the enemy and hit them crossing the river with them back a hex. I don't know how much sense that makes. <laughs> um... Because to me, the idea is I'm spending all my movement points to cross the river, getting into this swampy terrain and everything, yet I still have enough, you know, effort left to actually engage. I think I'm going to say no to that. And that is going to mean there's no reason to go into charge with this unit, which is what I was really trying to figure out. And that's fine. You know, I mean, this is, again, this is just me making a decision on the fly. That thing's not charging. There's a problem. Let me try switching chargers. Because for some reason, that one, I have, if I twist the little connector. But anyway, that, that's what's going on, is that I'm just going to do a movement order with these guys. And they're just going to all cross the stream. And this artillery fire was useless. This is the other thing. It wouldn't have any effect if I dropped the artillery fire in that hex. So like, I shouldn't have even fired this gun. I'm just risking my uh, capability. My, uh, you know, I, I, I could have lost the gun because of it. It's okay. <laughs> All right, let me, uh, let me swap batteries again and see what the hell is going on with that one. So I've started activating some units. Um, the French have just been passing with their reserve, except for one thing. As the Allies came close with these guys, I tried to roll a charge order for them, try to break that infantry up a little bit. I mean, I can't really break it up. All I can do is force its first fires, but take, you know, take some damage to, to them, and that's what my Dragoons are basically for, as far as I'm concerned. Anything else they do is gravy. But, they didn't get it, and so they fell back. But, uh, for the Allies, I've got this interesting question. I don't know what the hell to do with this fucking Cav. Like, this wing of Cav facing a wing of Cav. Um, but, I wasn't close enough to charge, so I'm, you know, I'm moving them up. So they're in charge range. Try to break the cav here. This wing is just useless, right? It's just holding the line. Um, I've got extra cav in it, and that's fine. I may end up committing the support line somewhere else. I don't view this as being possible to do a damn thing unless the battle's already won. But I have limited amounts of infantry for the Allied force, so I guess that's why they fill in that part of the line with some cav. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I actually thought this was cav facing infantry. Because again, I can't tell, I can't tell by visualization what the units are. I'm still not used to it enough. I've played several hours of uh, near Winden using these icons. I, they're just not sinking in. Uh, the difference between this and this. Yeah, I can see it when I see them next to each other. But when I'm focusing on one unit, it's very hard. And again, it's not ter terribly easy for me to see the difference between the infantry and the cav on this chart either. Uh, the graphics here, again, they're compass level graphics. <laughs> There's nothing terribly wrong seeming about them until you try using them. And then they're just not like, uh, okay, sometimes compass does things where it's terribly wrong. Like here at least I can understand why they made the choices they did as opposed to like, you know, 
using Comic Sans as the <laughs> as the font, <laughs> or uh, yeah, as the font in the uh, uh, in the Ancient Egypt game, and uh, and some of the color choices that they put in uh, Balance of uh, is it Balance of Power? Can't be. Can't be called that. Yeah, it's called Balance. Wait, it's called Balance of Powers, not Balance of Power. Balance of Power was the old uh, computer game where you played either the, you know, kind of a Twilight Struggle type situation on, on a computer. But the problem was either player could just say, yeah, that's too important to me. I'm going to go to nuclear war if you do that. And then the other player either has to back down or you eventually like, you know, you keep, you, you just have these these exchanges where it's like, yeah, I'm willing, I'm willing to increase the tension if you don't back down and you increase the tension. And eventually you come to a point where you either lob nukes or you give up that particular situation. And if you use nukes, both players lose. <laughs> if you don't use nukes, yet you've threatened, you probably won't, like, the. why is the other player going to back down? If it's two human players playing it, and the game could be played either against an AI or, or two human players. Um, if it's two human players playing, I, I mean, come on. It, it was almost automatic. Like, yeah, I care. Yeah, I care. You know, once you signal you care, the other guy's got to back out, right? You don't have an option of, like, a proxy war uh, I mean, you do through other mechanisms, but, but when, once you start making the threats, it goes, it, it's like you're either going to back down completely or you're going, you know, the other, one player's either going to back down completely on the issue or you're going to go to nuclear war. Uh, and you both lose. Um, against the computer, the computer, you, you had the capability of trying to figure out when the computer was bluffing but there's absolutely no reason uh, under the game why, like, a player would bluff, right? <laughs> it's just bullshit. <laughs> and given that, and that the computer would, like, be willing to go to nuclear war over certain issues, it, it just, it was, it was just a fucking weird game. I remember having a friend or two who really liked it, and I, I couldn't understand why. Um, because the game theory in it is just horrible. Uh, where the fuck was I? God damn it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that game has some really weird color choices on the counters. And some of them, some of the counters are unreadable. Some of them are weird color choice counters that are unreadable. Some of them are more reasonable color choices that are unreadable. But, you know, they choose to put, like, just like Whiff did this, too. Like, black print on really, really dark blue, and you can't tell what the hell is going on. Um, there's nothing that egregious here, but I don't capture the information on these counters at all. Well, on these counters, unless they're adjacent to each other, and on these, for whatever reason, the appearance that they've taken uh, with these kind of long, thin uh, NATO symbols, even though they predate NATO. Um, I absolutely don't, not only do I not register, I can almost not see the difference. Like, I really kind of have to concentrate too much. And I guess that's the issue. I have to concentrate too much to discern what I'm looking at. And a, a brief glance at the situation on the board, which is where it's most important, isn't sufficient to be able to tell you know, like I look and I'm like, oh, well, it's at the front. It's got to be infantry. You know, <laughs> I, I, I just can't imagine like a line of static cav trying to hold hold a defensive line like that. It doesn't make sense. They should be charging out to meet me or something. I don't know. And they will. They will. Uh, we'll see. Here we go. <laughs> I got a charge command from these guys. They're going to come out and attack. Uh, they don't hit the infantry. They've got to pick uh, the cav in preference, but actually, yeah, I don't want to hit the infantry. Okay, do I? 
I was back here. If I pick this guy first, he could hit this. Then the next guy under could hit that. That would put a situation, those two there. This guy then could hit the infantry straight on. Force it to first fire and fall back. It's a, it, it's a good question of whether I want to do that. I think I actually do. And you can see I crossed the boundary. Now, the way I'm playing, or I'm trying to play, is now there's going to be a little boundary marker here. I'm going to be allowed to be here if I so desire. <laughs> That's that's going to be you know a kind of a kind of querulous thing, right? I'm not going to worry too much about it. I don't think I actually even need to use markers for it. But by doing this, let's hit what we got. So let's do the infantry first, um, which is I don't retreat. So all I do is I reduce this. That gets its first fire out of the way. It keeps its depth marker. And am I disordered? Yeah, you're always disordered when you attack. And I must retreat a hex. Good enough. Hey, I'm back within my boundaries. Then I'm gonna conduct these two attacks. And maybe I should have waited until they didn't have an open flank if that was going to happen. Because flanking doesn't matter with Cav in the same way. I had to charge straight in. I can't do anything clever when I moved into charge. I can't attack when I'm not in charge. Um, unless I'm adjacent already. So what happened was, okay. I hit this unit, retreated. That's fine. I took his first fire away. Nothing to do with the, uh, the brigade guns. The second was a hit here. I bounced off. Fell back, no problem. The third was here. I got a successful hit on the A2, uh, on the plus two table. I got an A2, which means I'd get to advance two. I'm not going to get to because the defender got a retreat two, fine, um, and is disordered. So the defender falls back, two hexes, is disordered. Attacker's always going to be disordered after the entire thing. But because the flank wasn't covered, or, or because the flank was being covered by this bottom unit, this unit's able to retreat. If he hadn't, if, if I had had a complete line there, I'd have to roll on the cav unable to retreat table, which might or might not have resulted, you know, in a route instead, which could have caused all kinds of problems. But instead, I just chase him away, and this guy takes the front instead. He replaces the other unit. This is one of the places where if I've got this kind of formation held, it wouldn't be the same situation. Like if I was keeping track of um, how they were actually positioned, I feel like those separate, like this situation would exist and this unit would have no protected flanks anymore. He'd be facing this way and on his next action he'd probably want to turn uh, and, 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 and return to, to position. You really need two units to cover an angle like that. Without the two units you can't do it correctly. But the way the base rules work, and I really don't want to do the uh, keeping track of, I, I don't want to keep track of two, multiple facings in a hex, right? I understand completely the decision not to do that. I just want to keep pointing out what is like, what's kind of wrong, right? <laughs> if you wanted to add more complexity, that would not be um, a terrible choice. Did I say I was going to do that one? I really don't want to do that one. Um, this battle feels like it's got stuff going on that, I, I don't know. Maybe at some later date, I will try that. I do want to play around with moving the boundaries of the wings, though. Now, I've allowed the allies to make the, all their crossings at once instead of interrupting them. There's, again, no advantage for me to leave, let them have a, uh, an open flank. And now that they all have full flanks and are double unit, 
there might be some advantages to attacking. And it's very easy to get into charge. I have, basically, the allies have to get to a certain range and give me the opportunity to charge, or they could just move right up to my, my line and give me the opportunity to hit them without the, without the momentum bonus, or even just two hexes away. I think, think I've kind of given the French the best chance that they have uh, that they could possibly have here. Uh, but I also want to break up their line and open things up so that I can push down. The problem, of course, is I've got nothing that can do anything about Oberglau. I've got no infantry in this wing and no infantry in this wing. And I don't know what that's going to mean. But basically, this whole section, I feel, is not going to be able to be attacked. But again, if I change the rules with wings a little bit, if I break through here and start to win this, I could actually uh, start to make attacks here, keeping this as, you know, extending this wing into the area behind Oberglau. And I feel then that at least there's some opportunity for these units, and there's a lot of cav there, to do something of value, right? Although, you know, the thing of value might be just clearing this wing, that would win me the game. Uh, on, on the other hand, threatening the flanks of these supporting units, forcing them to turn and everything, that all feels like it w is what would happen, not just pressing forward down, you know, and, and, and then turning. You know? <laughs> it, the wing boundaries do not make sense under all circumstances, and that's why I feel that one is absolutely necessary to, f to change in the rules. Again, like I said in, you know, the end of the Nearwinden, there's missing rules, and maybe they cover all of this. The developer has indicated to me that, yeah, that, that some, some of the problems you're having are, are, are adjusted by, by the missing single rule. Yeah, maybe. I'm finding it pretty hard to believe. Like, they're going to have to basically loosen the restrictions on what these, uh, what these wing boundaries mean. That I'm not going to have to pull units back. That I can keep pushing in and stuff like that. Because, or they're going to have to do something like, oh, this unit is like between two wings or over here or something along those lines. And is allowed to be in that state. I, I don't see either of those things happening. Like, <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I just don't know. They'd have to make a lot of conditions. But as it is, I'm going to do kind of an on the fly, as needed, change the wings where, where I desire. And that French first charge has not been very effective at all, other than scaring this unit away. Uh, bounced off a couple of these units I hear. Made the attack here again, trying to take advantage of that, um, of the fact that this guy can't retreat. This one was actually successful. I got a similar result. I was over on what plus one table, um, where I got like an A1 D DR2. I didn't get any good rolls at all, and I got a lot of kind of bad ones, nines, is and whatnot. Um, but he basically got a hit that forced him to roll on the cav unable to retreat, but with the minus four on it and a roll of a two, yeah, he's perfectly fine now. And the allies will be in a position where they can make a counterattack. But now the way the orders are set, all these French units get to go first. Whatever that means. Might mean dressing ranks, because I've got a lot of disordered stuff. Made an attack, it's time to try to, you know, regroup. <laughs> Remember, uh, the momentum table is different by era, and now we're in the later era where the French Cav is less effective uh, than, uh, you know, it's kind of funny. Because this French 1701 to 1714 would actually fit under the all other. They could have just gotten rid of allies and said all other. <laughs> but anyway. Um, 
in part because there's something that's not covered. I don't know if there was any. Let's look in the chart. Because there are non-French units on the French side. Let's take a look at who we've got here. Uh, an infantry brigade, infantry, infantry. The pale blue are going to be Bavarians, right? Is that what they are? I don't know. There's, you know, there's stuff that's actually kind of iffy that I'm counting as French. So there's Swiss and foreign troops here. Uh, so we got Swiss here. I don't know if they're all infantry, but the only thing that I would really worry about is, is, the, uh, is anything that's colored different from the dark blue, just as a, a matter of convenience more than anything else. I don't want to have to be looking in the rule book and trying to hunt down what they are. But maybe everything on the French side follows these rules. Anyhow. If there was an all others instead of all other allies there, it would handle the French outside of this time period, where they're at their optimal. And then later on, the British, Dutch, and Danes <laughs> become uh, a more aggressive type of cavalry, really. OK. Have I done enough? I think so. I've gotten kind of half the board. I've gotten kind of the, the entire uh, uh, right flank of the Allied Army done. I'm going to put these here, and I'm going to call it um, a day, basically. I've got to, I absolutely have to go shopping today. If I don't, like, <laughs> I don't know. I absolutely have to, which is... I've just become so fucking lazy about doing anything, anything at all, anything that involves getting out of my chair in front of my computer. Here we are back at Blenheim, uh, working our way through that first turn. Um, but personally, <laughs> it's a little after midnight. I've got a little bit of time uh, beyond raid in which to, uh, in which to, to do a little bit of this. Like I've got like a break of about, works out to be about a half hour. Um, I took a nap because I went shopping today, <laughs> and I have food um, for the next couple of weeks at least. Uh, of course, it's kind of fucked up. Um, I took a different path home, and it ended up bloodying me in various places. Uh, I scraped up my arm pretty bad, and I think I actually cut my back. I can't see. I guess I could try a mirror. Anyway, let's get going. But it's good to have food. And maybe I can get other shit done too. Finding places where I screwed up on the setup chart. I'm going by what's on the map, so I'm switching things where necessary. I don't know what was going on. Maybe I was tired or whatever. But what's going on right now, the French uh, center here, the H. Hochstadt Plain, the Cav is beginning to try to force the first fires to end. Now this unit couldn't retreat, uh, and it went on the do not retreat table, and it came out okay, just disordered. But elsewhere, I'm starting to cause them to uh, to blast off their first fires. I may be able to get like attacks over here because these guys were slower going across uh, going across the river. Uh, I would have been able to put crossings over here and that would have actually aided these at coming up further. Over on the other side the Allies are starting to move up their second line. Remember this is more of an approach than we had in the the Neerwinden battle so and, and maybe it's not supposed to be. <laughs> I really don't know because there is no rules for uh, the Allies to set up. Hopefully that makes it into the errata. It probably doesn't take much, but 
<laughs> need to be a couple of rules there about it. Otherwise, people like me will just make shit up. Um, and other people who are, you know, less willing to do that will be frustrated as hell. Uh, anyway, we'll keep going with this. I think we've gotten to a point where the French are basically going to pass. The French have... Um, some of them were able to hit. Some of them weren't able to get hits in. Or uh, these guys made an attack and bounced off. I, you know, they're just they're making the first fires uh, happen. Um, but some of them weren't really able to attack, or it, for example, trying to attack a, a unit that's already taken a hit and that has its lines solidified. Yeah, I can't. I can't attack that. Um, some of them didn't want to attack. Uh, this one failed on its chance. It wanted to because it would have been able to do a flank attack here and get a, a first fire away here. Remember, the Cav has an easier time recovering from those uh, first contacts with the infantry. So there is some value to having Cav in the front. I'm just worried that it's like, you know, going to get busted up because the infantry has an essential advantage but it's not that. So if we look at the infantry versus cavalry, when the infantry attacks, it just basically forces the cav to retreat, but that might end up causing a rout because of the inability to retreat, um, which is really problematic, right? You don't, like, cav attacks and can't retreat, it's fine. It rolls on this table. It's pro. It, 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 it's uh, it, it's got a especially if they've got a big strength, for whatever reason. Like bigger cav units are harder to route. I not really or or better or whatever are are harder to route. But I'm not really sure the why of that. Like, is it just that they're bigger or or what? Or are they actually just higher competence? Um, It'd be kind of interesting to see <laughs> as I go off on these weird little tangents here, but I'm interested in the scaling here. Yeah, I think I think size is is approximately the same. So this the the strength value is going to be more the competence of the forces, how 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 well they you know execute their volley fires in terms of infantry and everything, better training and cav. Uh, you know, how well they actually do in the fight. So that actually does make sense. Um, the thing that kind of makes it weird is the idea that, oh, I'm taking hits on the infantry. If it is about the same size. Um, let me just make sure. Because that, that seems to be how it's worded here. Uh, Units in the game represent a single infantry battalion or two to three cavalry squadrons. Artillery units, I thought it was regiments. Um, artillery units represent about eight to ten guns. Yeah, that sounds to me like that's about uh, the number. It, it, the number of units on each counter is about the same. Uh, some of the cav units look bigger than others. But maybe I'm maybe I'm just comparing the dragoons to the normal cav. Okay. Now some of the infantry look bigger. Like look at this. This has three lines. This only has two. I was checking to see if it had a depth marker under it, which would really disturb me because it would indicate that this is actually a bigger unit than that. But it doesn't. But like this one has a depth marker. And, is smaller, so that may just be the deployment, how many ranks uh, uh, there are in the unit. Um, but it would also tend to indicate the size, but like the depth marker might indicate that there's like another line of units behind there or whatever. So this might just be the, <coughs> the front lines. I, I really don't know. I really don't know. Uh, the, des the, the image designation, I don't have a good feel for what's going on with it. 
and I don't feel like this gives a particularly good explanation or description of that. Maybe something in the historical notes does. I read them, but I don't remember that. Like, I'm having to look here, and I'm not seeing anything. Uh, but the feeling is that these are approximately the same size units uh, across the board from the rules itself. Um, where was I? I? I was trying to describe something that was going on in, in the game instead of getting hooked into the, hey, what, what is troubling me? Um, yeah, I, I could have made an attack here using my artillery for the guns, but I don't really like that because I'm, I'm going to be attacking into the swamp. I don't really want to do that. <coughs> um, so I think the French are done. And the question is, do I really want to move some of the Allied forces forward? And in some cases, the answer is yes. The biggest question I have is this fucking... Uh, sector, wing, whatever, of the battlefield, which is just like, I just feel like there's no reason that I should advance. Um, I'll just be getting closer to those guns there. By the way, these guns, I wouldn't have posit. well, I don't know, I, I probably would have positioned them in the town here or something. Instead, with the idea that I would rather be hitting, um, I'd rather be hitting something that can actually affect. I didn't have the idea that there's not going to be any combat here. Knowing the, the full setup of the Allied forces, I would not have put this gun here. I wouldn't have put the, uh, the battalion with a gun there either, simply because it's pretty obvious to me there's not going to be any combat from that direction. Now, if the wings restrictions are released the way that I kind of think that I'm doing, uh, yeah, it's possible that some kind of flanking maneuver could force the French out of uh, Oberglau there. Um, so then that means the only thing I'm going to be doing is really looking down the line of the Allied forces and seeing which ones I want to move forward a little bit. In some cases, like here, hey, I got units on this line still, so I can't advance any further. Same here, you know, I'm pushing a little forward, but I'm not really worrying too much. I'm definitely not worried about getting reserve lines into place. It's going to be a long time. This game takes a while for things to start breaking and for you to really need reserves to be closer to the line. So none of this really matters. Such a large number of units, and I'm kind of getting familiar with the battlefield, and so the turn is taking longer than like a late, like a, the later turns in Nearwind and that I was getting used to. When the Allied forces were pretty much gone, the French still had as much at the front as they did all game. We'll pretty much call that turn. Uh, a little bit of advancing along here, nothing impressive. Um, no routed unit movement. Now it's time to unflip, remove artillery hits, all that kind of crap. Well, here it is. Uh, uh. I guess Friday morning, 3 a.m. after 3 a.m., 3.30, somewhere in there. I didn't wake up until 7 p.m. on Thursday. And I have been doing my usual messing around. Mainly playing Raid, but then... And watching videos. You know, there's so much... Like, it's not like Raid takes much attention, right? For the most part. So a lot of it I'm just grinding and I'm like... You know, doing what I probably would be doing if I didn't have Raid for most of the time that I play it, which is just fucking around on the computer and watching vids and stuff like that. Um, that's what I did, you know, at other times in my life. Uh, I also really, apparently, like, I had a lot of blood on my arm after shopping because I tried to walk through some trees that I had never tried before and ended up doing some badness. But what I didn't realize is how badly I cut up my back. And, you know, the arm, it's fine. You know, the back, which I didn't notice because I couldn't see the blood there, <laughs> is in really bad shape. Um, 
And I'm actually worried I may not want to go dancing today. Anyway, let's get some started. I'm probably not going to make the whole turn through here. But, uh, yeah, you know, I had thoughts of, I get up at around 2 p.m. I go down and get new keys made because I have to uh, go out tonight. And Again, I don't want to just rely on. I want to be able to carry keys with me instead of just whatever I hide in my yard. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but if I lose my set of cues, I th life becomes a lot more difficult. So, like, I'm not going to carry keys with me if I go. Right. And I probably shouldn't tell you guys I hide keys in my yard, but they're <laughs> hard to find. <laughs> Let's put it that way. This isn't an under the doormat type thing, especially when I'm drunk. And it's dark. Uh, okay. So we start off with the artillery fire. Just lost another gun due to artillery shortages or to ammo shortages. Got a couple of hits here. Got a hit over here. What's this cav? I don't know. You know how much does it do? Well, it breaks up their capability to launch attacks or whatever uh, against my now disordered French cav unit, I guess. Uh, the, front, the French artillery, the defensive artillery doesn't do much because if you get a lot of nasty hits on you or in front of you, you might just decide, okay, let's not attack this turn. <laughs> Whereas the offensive, the defender can't really just say, let's not defend this turn. <laughs> they have a choice, largely, first of all, if it's effective fire, they have no choice. They're stuck there and under bad circumstances. Uh, but if it's not effective fire, it's like, do you want to give up some of your defensive position and make that a place the attacker doesn't want to be? Of course, the order's momentum can change things there. And let's go to the wings. And again, I'm going to force the French to have to go first with their activations because I really think that it's just an error the way the rules are written on this. At this point in the game, neither side has anything they want to shift. Now, the French have absolutely nothing they can do. They could put leaders in charge of units to get them killed so that they go through their stack or something. I don't know. There's no generic leaders, so, you know, I don't know. You know, a generic leader should spring up. Um, I, I know that there was a response that there was some kind of option to, like, that they wanted to use to let those guys be involved in attacks or whatever, but they, uh, the rules as written, they don't have any effect. Um, so who knows, you know, maybe they could be given a plus one like they were quality leaders, in which case you would use them all over the place because they're useless everywhere else. Um, but for the allies, they have some formations that have large stacks. So I will probably shift some of those leaders. I'm going to ignore the French leaders. They have absolutely nothing they want to do. Might want to move some of these into support line, but why? Why bother? Uh, it's not clear that there's any advantage at this point. The thing is, in the reserve line, they have a little bit more flexibility, although they're infantry in the reserve, which may not actually have a bonus. See, transferring cav from reserve is a bonus. Reserve if support is full. Is that a bonus or a penalty? I think that's a bonus. Transfer from reserve if support is full. Oh, that's transfer to another another front. Yeah, so without filling this up, transferring my infantry isn't particularly easy. But the thing is, while they're in the reserve, they can be transferred with a be benefit no matter what, right? Not necessarily, no. No. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I probably want to shift things, but it would make for more clutter up here, so screw up. And for the allies, they don't particularly want to switch their leaders either. I'm just going to unflip him and ignore this entirely. I don't want to do a damn thing. And that way I don't have to unflip as many units. Um, why don't the allies want to do anything? Well, they have two formations where they have a lot of leaders, in G and in U. G... Is Prince Eugen. 
He's a two-point leader. I would rather not use him for it, although he would be a big advantage to a Cav unit. Eh, not really. He still only adds one to the combat. So he's a better leader uh, to have him on the field if I do need to transfer things. So I don't want to make that decision quite yet. Uh, the other one, you, is Churchill. He seems like an obvious choice, but I've got an infantry line facing cavalry. There's... You don't roll on the combat charts when infantry are attacking cav. I would get a defensive advantage if cav are attacking at-risk infantry, but that at-risk infantry I, it just seems like a bad idea to me. <laughs> Although, like, losing him might actually be an advantage. So, we'll go to the brigade activations, and we'll do the charging units. And then maybe I can get to sleep, I don't know. It was hard to fucking sleep on my back, man. I'll wear the cav were first, and even though there's a penalty for cav dress ra dressing ranks, two of the units managed to do so. The unit I most wanted to do so didn't, though, and it stayed in charge and had to hit. Now, it was kind of a little weird. First of all, I found I was cheating. I had uh, some regular calves stacked with these dragoons. I had the dragoons on top. I shifted the regular cap back because that was illegal. Um, why is this not disordered? It should be. It hit. Um, and I hit this way. And for the most part, got no effect uh, down the line. But here, I got forced back. And basically, both sides are disordered uh, across the line. You, you know, some, some decent die rolls. Well, mostly they were bad die rolls. Two of them were minus one. This one was at plus two, I think. I don't know. Um, which, of course, is the one that I got the worst result out of. <laughs> the only stuff that's actually uh, charging is all cav. That's why the French, the defenders, are in charge. And because the Allies had to advance. Um, <coughs> so, we had another section of cav here. The gendarmes managed... To, and uh, over here, what is this? Massenbach managed to uh, to get into dress ranks again and recover, strengthening themselves. Great. Not the unit under the effect of fire, however. I don't think it has any damage to it. Eh, it's disordered. That's that's going to be problematic. Uh, but Grignon here continued his charge. And one unit bounced, in fact, bounced far. It got a, is that even possible? Let me, let me see if I cheated. Yeah, it got an R2 result. And what's interesting is the attacker usually doesn't get a disordered result. In fact, they may never get a disordered result. Yeah, they never get a disordered result. So if they launch an attack, they will survive it unless they get over in this terrible, like, uh... No, they will survive it, right? This is the bad side. Um, no. There's a couple of eliminateds over here, which will just wipe them out. Okay. Um, I was misinterpreting the chart there. But yeah, so it is possible for a badly outnumbered attack to just go horribly wrong in the unit to dissolve, which makes sense. However, the defender might be disordered already, and if they get another disorder, and that's what happened here, uh, you'll end up with a routed unit. And they passed their check. I'm going into a little more detail than I will as I go further, but less detail than I did in uh, Near Winden. Um, and that'll put me on the marches. I don't want to keep playing. Uh, it's cold up here. <laughs> and I have all kind of excuses. But basically, I wanted to get a little bit in. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I'll be up later in this morning because I cannot seem to sleep 
um, when I want to anymore. And, you know, and now I'm like, unfortunately, very set in a bad uh, sleep schedule. We are on, a, of all things, a Saturday morning. Um, what happened, I woke up uh, just about 5 p.m., which is when I have to get up for a uh, raid. And, you know, depression, the injuries to my back from walking through trees, and uh, other aches and pains, but mainly, most of all, just, it's been raining pretty hard, and it was raining pretty hard yesterday. I mean, just continuous, and it's going to be raining for days. I just didn't want to go out and get wet. <laughs> that's, that's what it came down to. Um, and so I skipped dancing. It was, you know, there are like different sets of DJs, and this is the one that, I don't know. They're okay. It's, uh, there's always one guy, but the other spot gets filled. And uh, this is the one that I feel happens the most, and I'm just kind of like, yeah, I, 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 can, I can pass. <laughs> Not that excited. So we'll get here, and I think we're at the beginning with the Allies choosing to activate units that are in March for me, uh, orders. This is a big deal because timing actually matters here, where it didn't matter with the French commands. They, all the commands I played with the French had, you know, were going ahead of all the other, all, all the allied units. But now, almost everything, in fact, everything that's left is going to be uh, in this one set and we're going to be alternating. I actually think, it's hard to tell, but I think the most important thing is to get my first fire off with this. Although it kind of doesn't matter who, who does it first. We both have first fire, so it's just going to expend on each. And I may not get it, so maybe that's not wise. Um, the thing is, the cav that moved forward and already did stuff, that's all been activated, right? So, there's no chance that's going to do anything. There are a couple here, Lorraine, Meredwit, and Villier. Why? Okay, so these must not have gotten any activations before. So this may actually be where the most interesting options are, where I have the opportunity to do a charge before the French do. Of course, this main thing, this Holstein back, which is here, that's not going to get anything interesting going because we're already kind of tied down. Sure, we can get a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of momentum there. These units don't care about, they're already tied down. Where's Lorraine? What has happened to the Lorraine Cav? That's what I'm missing. Oh, they're under here. So they could get hit, but that would be part of Holstein back. Whereas over here, this might be the most interesting. But I may want to dress ranks there because it looks like I've taken. Wait, that's infantry, isn't it? That's infantry. Oh, this is all infantry up here. Yeah, not much. Not much I can do there. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I just I, I'm trying to fig, I'm trying to you know puzzle out in in real time allowed, what my thinking is, one of the problems, of course, and it's been a consistent problem throughout this game, is the not being able to distinguish the counters. Um, and again, you know, by this point in the process, you would think I would be able to, but it's really, really hard for me. Uh, in that case, what the hell? There ain't much I can do. I can chase the calf back. That isn't going to do much. I, I just have no idea. Like, I can't think of anything that is really sort of a primary choice. 
Once things clear, you know, if I start getting some penetration here, I might want to bring this things from the cab from this uh, wing down to try to hit here. I don't think there's village here no. So that might be of some value. Plus, there's an artillery that's exposed, which is particularly interesting because I can just hit that. Unfortunately, I can't cross this without taking a full turn. So there's no no action of interest that can happen there. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything terribly exciting where I want to particularly do anything on any given unit. I actually don't want to attack these calves. This is the problem. The infantry doesn't want to hit cav. It, it, it's why, like, the cav in the front is kind of cool because I don't want to hit it. I don't want to use my first fires up on that. I want to use them up on infantry where, where they matter because the cav can recover from my first fire. Um, but what choice do I have? I was forced to deploy my infantry in front. The French were forced to deploy their cav in front. Me, I, I certainly would not have deployed cav on either side. But given that the cav is there, I'm beginning to see some value to it in terms of blunting the effect of the infantry. And the infantry tends to be, I think, more decisive. Does that make sense? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, again, I'm, I'm thinking because the French are relying more and more on less shock cav. But the Allies are relying more on shock cav at this in this period as opposed to last. So I don't know how valuable cav would be comparatively. Hmm. Okay. Well, lots of thought. Let me just start fucking doing things because I got no idea and I'll probably just go right to left or something like that. Because I can't come up with a good argument. I had to keep still running but um, but yeah so decisions like this they're gamey things that you have to know to make the game work like to be able to make the system work for you in terms of getting what you want done and the same kind of situation say in terrible swift sword learning what columns I want to attack on on the fire tables right um, and, you know, once you get that down and internalize it, it becomes trivial. Uh, but this is situations that I have not faced before. And right now, they're a gamey impediment. Later on, they become a gamey thing still, but almost unnoticeable, right? Which is where you want things to be, I think. Uh, but there's another option, which is maybe I want to delay, right? <laughs> maybe I don't want to do the front things yet. I want to force the French to do them. And I think that's the case, I, honestly. I think I want to just start flipping units. So we're going to be flipping a lot of counters over as I do nothing. Um, and that'll probably be for both sides. Because I don't think there's anything that the French terribly want to do. They may want to activate some of these and try to force first fires out. But there's no real hurry to that. Once the infantry's fired its first fire, though, charging is great. I just, I scatter the cav and I push them back. And the cav is completely ineffectual, right? It's just able to blunt that one hit and then it just becomes non-valuable. And I have this whole line of cav up here. Um, I've activated all of them, tried, tried to hit where I could, got, got rid of some first fires in some places, but now the Allied infantry is moving up and chasing the cav, disordering it, and causing it issues. And causing it issues that, you know, I'm already finished, so I'm not going to be able to recover. And of course, these guys are already in charge, so they will be able to keep pressing. And in places like here, if I do get to keep pressing, I will route the cav. If the cav doesn't get out of the way quick enough. Now, this feels really distorted, right? Like, there's something that makes sense of, yeah, if the infantry can catch the calf and keep hitting it, 
it would make sense that they'd just break and they'd be gone. But why are they able to hit it? The calf just retreated a hex. Um, <laughs> it's disordered. There's no real reason why it's limited to retreating one hex away from this infantry over the course of, you know, 40 minutes instead of 20 or whatever, two turns instead of one. Eh, they wouldn't just stick around, and I don't know that they'd break just because they're disordered and have to retreat again. That's what the rules say. We'll go with it, but again, it feels like there's some stuff, and it has to do with the pulsing, right? But in some cases, like this uh, Massenbach, is that what it is? I can't really read. Massenbach. This unit here, it's not going to get another chance, right? The allied unit got charge, moving from movement. These guys moved from, I don't know, something to dress ranks. I'm assuming charge to dress ranks, this being the second turn or whatever. And now, because they're in dress ranks, they're more vulnerable. There's no way that they can win the speed race, right? I just... I don't know. It feels like something is happening because of the mechanisms of the game that really shouldn't be as common as it looks like it's going to be. On the French side, having activated these frontal calf, and maybe I shouldn't have, right? <laughs> uh, maybe I should have played the delaying game that the Allies were playing. Now I absolutely do not want to activate any of what I have in the front, the infantry that I have in the front uh, of, of the... the uh, wings that are infantry formed, um, I absolutely do not want to have to do the first thing. First of all, the allies are the attackers. Uh, they should be making the first move, but I'm not going to have any opportunity. Like, if I have less units, and I don't know, it looks like it's pretty close in this game. If I have less units, I may be forced to start triggering all of my front units, and then the allies can react with one of their front units uh, to hit. And it just comes down to, hey, whoever has the more units in the reserve doesn't have to do anything in the front. Mm, again, something that the system is imposing that, you know, you can argue like chip pull works better here. Yeah, but chip pull's going to give you like, you know, a 50-50 chance that you catch the calf in this unreasonable way. Certainly better than 100%, but still, you know, again, when you start trying to get out of that I go, you go, because it has its obvious flaws, new flaws show up. <laughs> and we're used to the I go, you go, and kind of willing to accept that sort of coordinated action across the board, which um, other mechanisms just, you know, don't allow, and probably it shouldn't be allowed, but nothing, no, no game system seems to really handle it well, except for stuff like, you know, the wooden ships and Iron Men trireme type plotted movement or pulsed movement or whatever, where SFB, car wars, whatever, uh, where everything's doing something at the same time, which is an absolute nightmare. It works okay with planes, with individual planes and individual ships <coughs> in engagements that really have very few discrete components. But when you're looking at this many units, yeah, I just don't think you want to do it. <laughs> so the big pass starts, and you can see I've flipped over a lot of the reserve units. Those, eh, they can pretty much do nothing. You know, maybe they'd like to catch up. They did so last turn, but maybe not. Who cares? But now we're in a more troubled position. So I looked at maybe moving the St. Paul units here. But I kind of don't want to move them. Like, I either want to pass and leave them where they are, or launch an attack with Wilkie here. One or the other. <laughs> uh, so I can look somewhere else and see, are there places where I'm more willing to pass? Here, because this uh, river 
is a barrier that's a pain in the ass to cross and I kind of don't want I, I kind of want to be up against it if I can gain ground in that in that area but here I can afford to flip units over and just say yeah I don't know I don't care if that moves now I actually do that's this thing I can shift that up and I will move these units forward just because but in a lot of cases, I'm gonna just be holding units back and not moving them at all. But I think what that means is the allies are gonna run out of units and they are going to have to attack with their front line. But that all has to do with the, the specifics of this battle and, and the way the battlefield is and everything rather than some kind of general rule that the system is gonna enforce where the attacker actually has to go first some of the time, more often. The potential uh, downside to activating your units back here first, especially if you didn't set up with nice uh, uh, retreat routes and whatnot. And in some cases, I'm not well set up for retreat. For example, if this unit retreats, it's gonna disrupt things here, take away first fires, cause problems, or uh, just cause a lot of ugliness, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, you might, you might make arguments of, yeah, it might not be such a great idea to just pass units. A little visual thing, this has to do with brigade names being kind of hard to distinguish. Um, I activated this Schulenberg here and Seckendorf is in the front line and I was worried that like, Well, this is part of Seckendorf. No, I can't even go up there. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, this only has two units, that's why. Uh, so that, that's actually an issue of it kind of looking like it's the same unit, just because I can only see, hey, long word that starts with an S and, you know, got C's and stuff like that and whatever. Uh, that may be partly my eyes. It's certainly got something to do with the height at which I'm playing, whatever. You know, if I zoom in real close, I can read these counters a little better. But it's not trivial to distinguish. Now they do make something to help a colored band that makes things a little different, but there are so many different brigades and if they're close to each other, and these are close in color and close in location and close in name, it's just a combination that like, yeah. This is actually something design could have done a better job with, like a little bit. Okay, you can't change the brigade name. The brigade locations, fixed. But the color band, does that designate anything that's of any importance? I don't know. Um, like, it might have, I'm trying to remember if this is one of those games where they tried to match something with the color bands on the units to have something to do with like, you know, a brigade flag or something like that. I don't remember anything to that uh, extent, but even if it is, that's a design decision that maybe is unnecessary, you know, <laughs> uh, like, making the infantry and cav look so similar and artillery and everything just look like blocks, blobs of troops, as opposed to, you know. I understand, I really do, I understand the desire to, to appeal more to the minis type of style of play. I, I do more than you, you know. <laughs> but, you know, when the shapes of the counters are all squares, so, so, so that's one of the things minis do, is the units on the base, the shape of the actual bases would be different. So for example, these infantry formations would actually look like these long formations, whereas the cav would look like a blockier formation. And the artillery would only have a few figures on it. And I think it would be easier to discern, um, certainly in 3D. Obviously, it depends on your scale, but I, I'm talking about, hey, let's, let's say we're working with like something really, really tiny, 
something maybe like three millimeter or something. I've never seen three millimeter, but you know, uh, something something that would fit in really well uh, with like, you know, being able to just use lichen for forests and whatnot at a certain height, um, as, as as opposed to trees with stands on them and all that, which I think are actually a mistake because they can't show all the figures, right? You could say, well, it's one to 10, just like the, the units. Yeah, okay, fine, whatever. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, if those colors don't mean anything for the uniforms, there very clearly could have been um, a decision, hey, look, this name and its location. Now, this could have been over here, but again, this is here. We've got a lot of light gray uh, bands over here. We've got a couple of yellowish bands here from different units, right? With similar names, again, starting with a C. This is a bad choice, man. This is a bad choice. Sure, people who have a, a, a color blindness issue aren't gonna get anything out of the bands anyway in some cases. But if you don't have that, um, at least you could get some advantage out of those bands being somewhat different from each other when the first letter is the same and they're in the same gen. It, the setup is fixed. The setup, not entirely. But in terms of which wing things are in, the names of the brigades are fixed. But those color bands probably are not, as far as I know. The few playtesty things I've done have all been over video. Uh, in part, you know, look, it's a lot easier as the developer or whatever to receive, you know, a written description of what issues there are but it's hard to get that shit down in the moment while you're playing, right? And I feel like capturing things like this, it's very easy in video and it's even possible to explain. Eh, my lights are getting weirder. I don't know if I've got another one coming online. Eh, I, 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 maybe I can turn up the power on them and see if they work better. But that's, yeah, that's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, old school, uh, older type, and I don't know, I, I think they produce both types still now, of LED sitting on a fucking dimmer switch. And I didn't know better. I bought LED lights for whatever reason. They looked like, you know, they were better than the fluorescents. I also think they last a little longer, but <laughs> I didn't mean to make strobes out of them. Something I wasn't expecting, and it comes down to like a one counter flip, which I might have easily made a mistake on. In fact, there was a time when I was absolutely uncertain of which one I did. And I didn't want to count them because I figured it wasn't going to be that close. Well, all of the units in the back and whatever units in the front I wanted to have to move, flip have already been flipped precisely. Like, nobody's had to flip something that they didn't want to, thereby causing, you know, freedom to the other player. And the French have the first flip. And they're gonna have to do something with one of their units on the front, and that's gonna allow the Allied forces to make their choices. Now, there was something that I kinda didn't wanna flip. I kinda didn't wanna flip these units for the reasons I explained before, but I'm like, well, I'd rather flip them than not because uh, I want to see the results of the combat more than I want to be up at the river edge, you know, if possible, right? Because chances are I'm not going to be successful everywhere. What that all means is the French just get to choose one. Now, the victory conditions are the French just have to last. So I'm going to simply flip this unit and pass with it. I could have gone over on that edge, uh, but I think this one's better. I have better defenses here, but on the other hand, because of the swamp, yeah, let's defend in a swamp. That makes sense. Let's build a castle in a swamp. Um, but then that just means the allies get to affect uh, with Wilka, but Wilka has a big frontage comparatively, which means it's going to swing things so that the French can then react with this and it shifts 
you know, who's actually committing more or committing first. So it all kind of works out. And after Wilka and then uh, what? Hot to feel uh, went. We come down here and uh, I'm thinking, well, I'll move Fink, but I'm facing Cav. And I just don't want to attack Cav, right? Like, I really don't want to. I want to use these as a guard against the other units, and I kind of don't want to attack here either, because I'm hitting a strong point. Mm, I mean, there's no great harm to that, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to have to hit this strong point, so I may go for that instead. Then, you know, I move row, and, and none of these guys are getting their charge orders, right? They're just marching up. Uh, they're trying, they're just not getting them. Uh, I move row and I, I get up there. Now this is all, well, this isn't activated, so I can chase some cav with these guys, which actually is what I should have been doing anyway. And that'll swing the initiative back in my favor where the French are gonna have to start activating some stuff. I shouldn't have done these, I should have done this over here. Forgot about them. Funny, what I wanna lead with in these cases is the units that have already first fired because all they're doing is chasing Cav. That's, they're not gonna do much more. Sure, I can disorder by using the first fire, but that's, again, that's, to the, that's what the Cav's there for, is to absorb my first fires. And for the most part, not much happened. Uh, Pressed up to the line here. Here. I think we scared some calf. Here we pushed forward. I don't think we scared anybody. I don't think we're in charge orders there. Um, here we managed to uh, successfully, and, and this happened in a couple of places, the gendarmes took a loss because the infantry was able to catch up to them. And uh, over here, Cav recovered, dress ranks. Fugger was unable to do anything. I did them last, actually, but. And this door lock uh, pushed some of this Cav back without too much effect. The infantry up here just moved up to get into contact. Give me more room to deploy my uh, support line or whatever. And we got a couple of routed units on the board. And those are gonna move. And uh, then we've got the big flip and that's it. And I'm gonna swap batteries and then load this up, I guess. The break during the big flip. I forgot to do these. I'm actually doing them where I'm supposed to. <laughs> uh, one of the French units, one of the French routers caused some disruption. Yeah. I didn't leave a channel for him. It's not a big deal. It means the support unit needs to dress ranks at some point. Because it's just cav. It would, s oh no, wait, that's infantry. Fuck, I can't tell shit. Uh, you know, I mean, I think about it in terms of, yeah, I'd have the cav in the reserve. Yeah, no. Sorry, that's infantry. Um, they lost their first fire, as did the unit underneath them. So, yeah, that's a, that's a permanent minor disability, right? Like, the thing is, all infantry kind of loses its first fire on first contact with the enemy, but I did it without doing anything. That's the problem. But of course, whatever hits I take after that, I can recover, so, you know. <laughs> anyway, I'm about, I'm, uh, I finished with the Allied flip. It's just a pain in the ass. Um, but now, I shouldn't be coming back. <laughs> I will anyway. So I went into some uh, discussion last time um, about how painful it is, you know, to flip a counter like this and then turn it. Okay, you don't have to do it that way, right? You can position your fingers like this and do a flip like that. Problem is, facing this way and doing this 
is a whole lot easier than turning your hand and doing this. I think this is easier than that little double flip I was doing, but it's causing more pain on the back and whatnot, you know? And again, all would have been solved by facing the counters in opposite directions on the different print sheets. I don't think GMT likes to do that. Uh, <laughs> I think SPI really liked to do that. Like they understood that concept or I don't know. I, I, I just don't know like why you would have, like why you would come to the decision to do it in what seems like opposite to the what what's natural, um, other than you had some real reason to drive that, and I think that someone at SPI came up with the hey, it's easier to flip and unflip counters if they are printed upside down on the back side. <laughs> <laughs> and they just started doing that. Now, they weren't consistent with it, uh, as shown with uh, were they? I think they were. I'm, I'm thinking about the Central Front series. I think all the original stuff from Central Front series, not all the number counters though, but all the original regular units flipped so you could go front to back perfectly, uh, very, very cleanly. But I think like some of the sheets of number counters, they didn't do that well. <laughs> Cause I remember like about half the number counters worked one way and half worked the other. And that really pissed me off because there's no reason to do that. Um, which kind of is an argument against that, like, maybe they didn't make this conscious decision, but I just can't imagine how you would, how you would sort of naturally just fall into all the counters printed upside down on one side. Because it seems natural to me, the way they'd be arranged and everything on the counter sheet, that when you compare the counter sheet, I mean, you know, the counter sheet's gonna look something like this, that you would flip it like this, and then everything would be facing that way, as opposed to, as opposed to flipping it like this. Because the counter sheets were always printed, um, you know, with the longer side being where the tops were aligned to. So it really feels to me like it had to be a conscious decision to, to do that. Now, if you're proofing them, right? If you're proofing them. Maybe this is gonna be in the wrong way. And, and I'm trying to think, so let's say this is the long side. <laughs> no, let's be confusing. And I've got the names on there. And what I'd be doing is the counter up here would be over here at R, right? Which means, let's say I'm proofing them separately. How would I want them? So if I flipped it this way, they would be opposite. That would be that, that would be that. So actually, I think that they did it for an easier way to do the proofing rather than any kind of, um, hey, it's just easier to flip the counters that way. I think there is actually an advantage to having them upside down and they probably got better quality control so that they didn't have the wrong units printed <laughs> on, uh, on the backs of things, which may be something GMT may want to think about given how much they've been fucking up recently. SPI fucked up too. The other thing is, SPI used to make big counters. Like, the, this was a, not their issue. It was their printer, their die cutting, um, and, and they contracted out for that. So, uh, but there was just like this consistent, like in a lot of cases, a lot of their, their games from a certain period would have like one or two counters on the counter sheet that were way big that like took up more, that, that took a larger die cut or something, like a wider cut than, uh, 
than the others. And that would make some other counters small. You know, like they just didn't have the precision that you'd desire. And I'm really just trying to avoid flipping counters. Come back enough times, I might as well do it once more. The task is done. So we go to 1 p.m. When does this end? For something. So I don't have a hell of a lot of time. The allies can't really dick around too much. 